Good morning uh, to you all. I hope I am audible. Please, uh, Helen, let me know if you can hear and see me. Yes, I can. I can hear you very well. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. And thank you for everybody who has uh, checked in this morning. Thank you for joining us yesterday. Uh, my name is Doreen Mulia. I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, as I had done yesterday, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Helen Bavazi. I will just give a brief recap of yesterday's session, and then I allow Helen to take us through today's session. Yesterday and today and tomorrow, we'll be talking about uh, mental health, especially for our children, focused especially on teenagers. Yesterday, we hosted a number of people. We hosted uh, Dr. Kenneth Okwari Kalani, uh, who came in with a medical perspective and uh, he was giving us his experience on um, putting together some of these policies, uh, especially on the national level. He's had a number of trainings, so he gave us an insight into the things that the government is doing for our children and for our parents. He referred to a number of documents uh, for our usage. We will be retrieving those and hopefully sharing them with everybody who attended this session. We also had uh, Pastor Sam, Uncle Sam, uh, who came in as a parent, as a teacher, and as a pastor. And he left us with a message about being intentional about our parenting journey, being intentional, being involved. And he reminded us um, that whereas we are investing for our children, we need to also be investing in them. That means give them the time, you know, give them the time, have enough time with them and be able to, 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 to date them. He said something about dating them, giving them time and being intimate with them so that we know exactly what's going on in their lives. We also had Cecilia. Uh, Cecilia is a journalist. She came in to share her experience covering these stories. She's covered a number of stories, investigative stories about children, about teenagers, and she knows firsthand how some of these problems are deep, how deep they go. So Cecilia shared with us um, what the children are going through, a number of triggers for them. She talked about the pressures of, of school, the pressures of excellence, what the children are going through every day, waking up very early in the morning and retiring very late to ensure that they have good grades in school. She talked about the bullying. She talked about uh, drug usage and how big the problem is. And um, we also had uh, Vivian, Vivian joining us yesterday. And Vivian has had first-hand experience counseling these children and teenagers together with their parents. Sometimes she'll have a sessions with the parents and guardians, and other times she'll have uh, sessions with just the children. And she talked to us about the, the, the things that they are facing. And when we asked her what we should be doing, she also talked about involvement, involvement with the children. I remember we asked Vivian if there is no hope for the children, considering some of the cases we were talking about yesterday, but she said there is so much hope which also definitely gave us, you know, gave us hope. So we had those four panelists. And today's session, we are going to be uh, having a sit down with Vivian. Vivian is, is a counselor, a children counselor, a teenage counselor, and she also talks to parents about things affecting uh, children. But today she's going to be focused on the teenagers. I remember yesterday we asked that uh, you ensure that your teenagers are joining in, and we hope that some of them have joined in. I'd like to welcome all our participants who are here today, and it would be nice to know if there are any uh, if there are any teenagers joining in, we had said if they're not comfortable joining in alone, they can join in with their parents or guardians. And if you're comfortable, they can join in alone. They'll be sharing questions and uh, Vivian will be answering them. She already has sessions from yesterday's session. Sorry, questions from yesterday's sessions that she'll be starting with. But if you'd like to uh, ask anything, you know, that she can take on, please uh, feel free to, to share. Uh, just also for your comfort, I'd also like to remind you uh, what Vivian does. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist and she works basically with children and families and she has a many years experience uh, of clinical, uh, school and private practice. Uh, Vivian is also a parent and she has um, dealt with a number of school going children. So she has first hand experience, you know, she's, she's dealt with a number of, you know, issues, people who are dealing with drug usage, but dealing with depression, anxiety, all those things she's dealt with. And um, that was basically the recap of yesterday's session, just to remind you, 
We will be having another session tomorrow. I'd like to, to, to just mention this before I can hand over to my co-moderator, Helen. We've had one session yesterday. We are having a session today and we will have another session tomorrow, which would also like to encourage you to ask the teenagers and the children to join in. If there are any children who are about 12, 13, please feel free to join with them in case they would like clarity on one or two things. But for the other, you know, bigger teens, 17, 18, 19, they can join in, they can join in alone. And for our guests who have, um, who are joining in and are under the employee assistance program provided by Minet. You already know how to access some of these services, but if you're new here and it's the first time that you've heard about us and you'd like to further this conversation, please send an email to, to hope at Minet. You will see the email on our flyers and we'll share it again in the chat shortly. We'll also share a number for our wellness coordinator who is Helen, who is going to moderate today's session. Please reach out in case you need any help, in case you want help individually for your child or your yourself or you want help uh, for your organization. Hope somebody has typed the email. It's hope at minet.co.ug. Please do reach out to us. Hope at minet.co.ug. Reach out to us. Let us know what you want and we'll be we'll be we'll, we'll be in position to help. At this point I'd like to hand over to Helen who is moderating today's session. Helen doubles as our wellness coordinator at Minet and she's a go-to person for all our wellness sessions. Helen, I welcome you. Over to you and Vivian. Thank you so very much Doreen Muluya, our human capital director here at Minet. Thank you so much for this morning. I'd like to once again welcome all of our participants for tonight's um, webinar. Um, first of all, thank you so much for tuning in yesterday. For those of you who are joining us just today, I say a good morning and welcome to this webinar. Um, the reason we are doing this is our big vision is securing Africa's future and our children are our future. Um, when we hear a lot in the, the newspaper happening about the mental wellness of children, it becomes our big concern automatically and what we can do as people responsible for wellness in our corporate organizations is to come up with a conversation on this topic to create broad awareness on what exactly is happening. And so as Doreen has ably given us a summary of yesterday's, a recap of yesterday's conversation, we were basically creating awareness from all perspectives, from the medical personnel, from people dealing with children, from parents our, uh, themselves, but most importantly, taking responsibility. Um, one of our values really is expertise, and expertise is to use our global knowledge and use our local understanding to be able to come up with solutions. And tonight, once again, um, as she has mentioned, um, uh, Ms. Olga uh, Kuda Vivian is here. She's a clinical psychologist, uh, but specializing with children, teenagers talking to their mind to be able to bring out what is really disturbing them. Uh, we understand that broadly that um, uh, from the perspective of teachers, of mothers, you all know that we are dealing with some kind of a different generation from where we grew up from. And a lot of things are happening in our environment. A lot of things are mind disturbing for a child. But what we want is to open a space for them to be able to talk about these issues. Uh, mental health is a really mind issue. And when you allow somebody able to enter that mind, we can be able to decongest. So tonight, our special session goes to children who would like to talk to them about mental health. Being the fact that it is just widening its space among us, our children, we would like the children to understand what mental wellness is, such that if they can identify the symptoms, the signs, the triggers, they are able to walk for help. And we are also using this forum again to educate teachers, to educate mothers on these warning signs such that they can seek for help on time. So without wasting a lot of time, I'd like to welcome our clinical psychologist working with children, Olga Vivian Kuda, and uh, to really share with us what she has for the day to open our minds and uh, enable us facilitate our going to deal with mental health for the rest of our lives. Thank you so much. Uh, Olga, you're very welcome. Uh, please have the floor. Thank you very much, Helen. I am delighted to be here. I wonder how many young people we have. I'm not sure if there's a way to verify how many young people we have, but 
let's go straight to, um, I'll share a very short presentation and thereafter we shall have um, interactions. I want to be sure that we have sufficient time to, sufficient time for the Q&A. So please allow me share my screen. So the presentation was uh, designed for young people who are looking at the ages of um, 13 to 19, but even if there are those that are 10, 11, 12, uh, I think that's still okay. So very quickly, what is mental health? For the parents who on the call yesterday or who are with us yesterday, we, we appreciate if you're back today, Dr. Kalani, explained what mental health was. But it doesn't hurt to look at it again. If you are mentally healthy, it means the following, that you know and appreciate your abilities, you are able to cope with life stressors, and that's important for the stresses of normal life, of the daily stresses that come along with being a human being or rather being alive. Why that is important is, on a daily basis, we encounter stress as it could be traffic jam that is going to delay you. It could be a payment that has delayed to come through. It could be exams. It could be because you have a conflict with a loved one or someone around you. So on a daily basis, we encounter stressors. If one is able to deal or rather cope with those, then it's one of the aspects of being mentally healthy. In addition, if you're productive and, and you make a contribution to your community, then you're also mentally healthy. Mental, being mentally, um, being healthy mentally doesn't, because some people say, I don't have any, any illness. That means I am, not, uh, I am not mentally sick. The absence of a mental disorder does not necessarily guarantee that you're mentally healthy unless you have looked at all those three dimensions. Just like the absence of, uh, if I'm looking at physical health, simply because I don't have cancer doesn't mean that I am healthy. It could be something to do with my digestive system. So it's not that I have a sickness, but I am not healthy. So it's the same with um, mental health. But most importantly is to note that like we all do have physical health, we all have mental health. However, because we all have mental health, along the way, anything can compromise or destabilize our mental health. Let's look at that using an illustration. So we have normal functioning, which is in the brain zone. And then we have the severe, the severe side that is towards, um, which color is that? Red, orange, whatever it is. But to show you that, and, and the line, we call this the continuum of mental health. So it has the arrows on the severe side and on the healthy side, meaning that you could be healthy, mentally healthy, but because something has happened in your life, you gravitate towards mild. If not managed, you could gravitate towards moderate. If not managed, you could gravitate towards severe. Even then, because there's an arrow pointing to healthy, it's very possible to move from severe to healthy. So that said, anyone on this call, whether you're 11 years old, whether you're 50 years old, anyone can get a mental health condition and anyone can recover and be productive even when they have a mental health problem when they're in treatment, when it's being managed. We, I, I will not say we, but I love to use this continuum for people to know that because my neighbor is um, depressed, like many people say these days, depressed, anxious, doesn't mean that 
I can't get depressed. So the more we appreciate this continuum, the more we shall perhaps become kinder and the more we shall be aware and therefore reduce the stigma around mental health. So what are the risk factors? What are the things that could predispose one to a mental health condition? So knowing that I was going to talk to children, I used um, pictures. Do we have any children on the call? I hope you can um, pick out some of the pictures and start to, to reflect on them. But one of them is um, bullying right at the corner where this young man is um, feeling terrible. There are people pointing fingers. I have been bullied before. I, I know how terrible I felt and I don't wish it for anyone. So when we talk about bullying, we talk about the victims and some people call them survivors of bullying, but we also talk about those children who bully others. Actually, the children who bully others need more help than the ones that are being bullied. The fact that you are making someone feel that way means there's a problem. So while we are handling, and it doesn't mean that I am invalidating how the ones that are bullied feel, but I only want to show um, that the ones that are bullied, if the ones that bully others, we, we need to focus on those. Many times they are expelled they are suspended and then parents come and talk to, to the school authorities. Um, they are punished in whatever way, but then their challenges are not dealt with. The fact that that is done, many times you find that that child has bullied another child. Why? Because bullying to them from their perspective and when we see them, bullying is a symptom of something. So we need to address um, the cause of the bullying. Is it that that child is feeling so empty or they are looking for some sort of control? Is it that they are also being abused at home that they have to abuse other people? Then we also look at um, traumatic experiences like accidents. Experiencing or um, witnessing traumatic experiences predisposes one to, to trauma. Trauma is anything that overwhelms the brain. So one is moving, let's say going to Kavale and boom, there's an accident. Totally unexpected, unplanned for, very shocking. So such, and also seeing other people die, even if you survive, but the fact that you know, oh, I survived by just a whisk, narrowly survived, that overwhelms the brain and could predispose one to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder where some people will say, I am unable to use the taxi again. I am unable to go to Kavale. So they will avoid anything related to the event. Then the other risk factor is poverty. Poverty means that you are, you are unable to get even the basics of life. It could be food, it could be healthcare, it could be housing, it could be, it could be anything. So look at that young man, look at his neighborhood, um, completely unclean, that means the chances of falling sick are high, but even when he falls sick, is there money for, for, for him to be taken to hospital? Um, does he eat nutritious food and the, and the like? And we come to domestic violence and anything related to fam family dynamics. As you can see, um, the child is being held, but imagine you're that child and you, you, you look at that fist. You're not sure whether it's, it's you that is going to be hit or it's your mother or it's your sibling. So the fact that that child is nervous the entire time, they are tense, they are anxious, predisposes them to mental health problems. And lately we see a number of those but also when there are family dynamics like divorce, like separation, somehow the children, um, not somehow, the children are actually affected because in some instances, parents have to, to, to decide if at all they do, who, who stays with who, who visits 
who visits uh, who, when, and how, um, and the like. Uh, how, how do you share the money? Who does what? So that uh, for children to see the people that they love separating and going um, different ways is not, is not always good news. So even if the divorce or separation is mutual, it's important for children's um, for the for the children's well-being to be considered. Discuss these things with them, prepare them, plan with them, and then we come to death. Lo losing a loved one is um, as painful as it can be for for anyone. So we all feel the emotional pain of of losing someone differently. But because I don't yell or scream like you do doesn't mean that I don't, I don't miss that person or I don't feel sad that they've died. But we see that increasingly children, we are seeing more and more children come to us because they lost a parent, they lost a best friend. Even worse during COVID, they didn't even have the opportunity to say, um, goodbye, like we do in Africa. So it's more of our ah, grandmother is dead, and that's it. You have to deal with the emotions. Or oh, uh, uncle so and so is dead, he's in a different country, and that's it. But that could have been my favorite uncle. Then we come to exams exams and the stress that comes with it, but also the pressure that comes with you have to be number one, you have to get four, you have to get um, uh, at S4, it's eight. Eight, between eight and 10, at A level, it's, you have to get 20 and something. So the pressure predisposes children to, my God, will I manage this? I have to wake up at night. I can't sleep enough. So on top of being a student, the mind is already busy. They have to wake up at night and read. They have to discuss. The, then they have to think about what will mom think if I don't uh, perform this way. Such and more makes children, um, anxious. My next slide is a summary of the risk factors. I couldn't fit all the, the pictures on there, but I love pictures. So physical um, causes, for instance, HIV. Yesterday, Dr. Kalani explained that HIV, there is a way HIV does affect one's um, mental health. Then head injury, you're in an accident, there's head injury. Before you know it, you can't remember anything that you knew before the accident. Um, what else haven't I talked about here? Stigma, tribalism. In Uganda, there are some tribes that are discriminated against. So such and more will really put a child in a position of, am I good enough? Am I worth it? Uh, we also talk about body shaming, especially in schools. But also in homes, we have parents who tell of the children you're fat and you don't look good. So the children, the child has to grapple with that as well. What signs should one look out for? So still, I use the um, pictures. So in the right corner, perhaps it's your left corner, I don't know, um, the different uh, moods, or what I'll call the mood swings. So when you notice mood swings, um, one moment your child is relaxed, the other moment they are tense, they are crying, they are alone. So that sudden shift in the mood changes communicates something. And then um, social withdrawal. So suddenly a child um, is alone. Not that they want to, but they may not have the energy to be um, around people, but be sure to, to compare what your child is or what your child is and what they were. They are children who are naturally um, introverted. So a child is alone, but again, at some moments you'll find them with a small group of people. But if such a child is now uh, seen to be um, alone, socially withdrawn, then one starts to, to question. Decline in um, academics, parents should watch out for that. A decline means that someone is not um, motivated, but also mental health affects the way we, we think. Mental health, mental health conditions affect 
uh, our memory. So that could also impact on someone's ability to, to read hard. So if I'm feeling sad, what are the chances that I'm going to pull out a history book and start looking at very long essays of, of Hitler and European history, or rather chemistry and all the equations that come with it? Then changes in um, appetite. So it could be that one is overeating compared to what they were before, or one is um, eating less than they were eating before. And that, that goes for, for sleep as well. It could be that one is oversleeping or one actually has difficulties initiating sleep and um, maintaining sleep. Then when children start to, when, when young people start to use um, alcohol and other drugs, then one should start to, to question is something wrong, including risky behavior. So on top of drinking, you find one is driving. Risky behavior also includes sex, okay? And then really feeling worthless um, and worthlessness will come with questions like, why am I even still alive? Is it better off for me to be dead? Am I the one making dad and mom to fight each day? So why should I still be alive? We have a summary of the um, signs to look out for, the ones that I just mentioned in the previous slide. So allow me move to, to the next slide. How does a young person look for help? How do they seek for help? So yesterday I mentioned lately, especially after the onset of, of COVID, we started to receive calls from young people directly from a 12 year old, hello. So they would go to the internet, look for areas where they could get, uh, or centers where they could get support from. And while social media has its negative side, social media or the internet also provides the advantage of providing us with information. So the um, children would go to the internet, search, then call. My name is so-and-so, I'm calling from, this area, I don't feel okay. I've tried to speak to my parents about it, but they don't believe in mental health. They tell me to go to church. They tell me to talk to my auntie, but I need to talk to someone. So lately um, we've received and we've received such calls and we are still receiving such, such calls. So first is for us to acknowledge that we all can't feel good all the time. We can't feel good all the time. And as such, sometimes will be difficult. So it's important for adults and young people to acknowledge. But also to acknowledge that seeking help does not reduce you to, less of a, to being less of a human being. And that's why celebrities uh, lately are coming out to normalize the act of seeking for help and saying it's okay to seek for help. It's okay to be known to have this, hoping that by doing that, the stigma around the health, health seeking behavior surrounding mental health will reduce. And my hope is that it actually reduces. For young people, we ask that they talk to a trusted adult. It could be a parent, it could be a school teacher, it could be a counselor, but it could also be a friend who knows one or two things about mental health and then signposts you to the right direction. So the list couldn't be long. The list is that short, but first it comes with knowing it's okay to be well. It's okay not feel good all the time. But before you, you, you acknowledge that, it's for you to also learn a few things about mental health. And that's what we've done in the previous slides. How do I know that I am not okay. If I don't know that I am mentally unwell, how will I seek for help? I will try other things, the quick fixes, the alcohol, the, the sex and the like, because I actually want a, a quick fix. But when I am aware of the basics of mental health, then I'll be able to seek for the right support. So ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Um, from me, I, 
if I made it very short, I that was my plan. If it was too long, that's a disappointment. Thank you so much. I'll hand you back to, to Helen for, for her to guide us on the next steps. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, the intent was not to make it very, very long uh, because the imagination is that we are talking to teenagers and their listening time span is really, really, really short. <laughs> so keeping it short was really deliberate. Thank you so very much. Um, our people participating on this uh, on, on, on this uh, webinar this 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 morning would like once again to thank you so much for tuning in, for being patient. I've seen your questions, I've seen your feedback, and the desire to have these presentations more and more. Um, after this, um, I believe you understand um, about a child's mind. I believe you understand what is really happening. Uh, the statistics are very very clear about what is happening with the change and the trends are growing and growing. But as Minet, uh, as solution providers for human capital uh, with a big vision for Africa, ours is just to make sure that you understand what is really happening, but also number two is that we have the solutions. Um, part of our programs is to create wellness for every employee in corporate organizations, those who are members of Minet. But I believe on this panel, there are people who are not part of Minet. Even then, we still have a solution. I've put a number on our chat, but for now, I'd like us to go straight into the Q and A. If you have any question regarding this presentation, it was basically about those signs, those things that we can see, the triggers, the risk factors that the children are predisposed to uh, in our environment. And, and we all know that these are things that we know that really happen every day meaning that our children are vulnerable, are vulnerable to mental illness if we are not taking cautions. We see accidents every day. Uh, we see family discord every day. It's happening in our homes. And sometimes we neglect the fact that it is actually affecting children because probably they don't have a forum to express this or they don't know how to express it. But just like uh, our clinical psychologist has explained it, you could see it in the different feelings and emotions expressed by children. So meaning that many of our children, if you can recognize, have gone through it. Maybe we just didn't know. But today we know what exactly is happening. And because everything that has been explained is really in our environment, just know that somehow, somewhere your children are being affected. And now that we know the help. But also, I just want to start with a question. I haven't found one in the chat room. I'd like to start by asking um, um, Dr. Olga, um, these things are really, really happening. What are some of the things we can do? For example, we don't plan to have a discord in the family, but it can happen. What can I do to the children immediately to even prevent them from this affecting them? Because these things we know will happen every day. But as family members, as parents, what can we do in the event that it happens? What is the immediate thing I can do as a parent to my children to avoid it affecting their mental health? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And um, it's, it's inevitable to have conflict where there is more than one person, a conflict is inevitable. How you handle the conflict is what is important. We've, we've seen parents tell us, we, we do have conflicts and serious ones, but it's intentional on our part not to have the children involved. And the children can suspect, but the parents are intentional in making sure, oh, the children will know that we have had an argument, but we are not dragging them in our argument. Many times when children are dragged in, let's say a domestic um, issue, like we are talking about now, it pushes the children to take sides. I'll either side with mom or I'll side with dad. Now, if I am siding with dad, each time mom sees me with dad, oh, so you don't love me, you love dad. Okay, I'll wait for you. If I'm siding with, with mom, it's still the same. And what is a child supposed to do? A child is supposed to benefit, to tap from mom and dad, but now you're leaving the child in a situation where they have to make a choice. You're leaving a child in a situation and we've seen videos where children and now the ones helping parents to resolve conflicts. 
the children have taken sides and they are now the ones reprimanding their parent, the other parent, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done this. So before we go into what, um, how to protect children, maybe this could be one of them. It's important as adults for us to know how to resolve conflict because it's inevitable. And how you resolve conflict is very important because you're teaching your children how to resolve conflict. If, if I know that every time I argue with someone, I should punch them in the face. The next time you visited in your office, your, school, your child's school will call, oh, your son punched his colleague in the face because that's what they know best, children imitate. So I'll keep it short and say, we have to, to know how to resolve conflict. And even if it spills over, it's okay to tell your children, dad and I are having um, a challenge, but we are doing our best to resolve it. Even by just doing that, you're teaching your child that conflict one is inevitable, but it can be resolved. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, thank you. Helen, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I muted it, I, I tapped on it one, twice. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Olga, for that submission. I think we well understand that the most important thing is really not to wait for the signs and the symptoms, but to right away start. And yesterday you talked about something very, very important about the parenting styles, okay? And um, I, I think I just want you to expound on them because now you have a bit of time. We still have a, some minutes to go. Um, expounding the, 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 the parenting styles and how they affect or, or how they support our children's mental health in this perspective. Okay, thank you. And as far as I know, there are four uh, types of parenting styles, some people call them approaches. The first one is, um, the first one that I'll talk about is the permissive parenting style where it's do, it's laissez-faire really. It's child driven. So the child has to sort of manage their life. And we've also seen some children present in therapy like that of I manage my life, it's me to draw my schedule, my parents are very busy. Sometimes they, they are available, but not present. And then we have a neglectful. Um, parents could be present. I mean, parents are present, but then absent at the same time. So I'm physically uh, present, but I am not available. Um, I am not there for you as and when. Again, the child will do as they please, but do as they please because they have no choice. They, they really have to do that. Every time there is a vacuum, it has to be filled. Then we have the authoritarian, it's parent driven, strict rules and regulations. You have to do as is and as I tell you, because I am your parent, there is no room for negotiation. There is no room for discussion. You have to do this. You, uh, some parents will even go uh, um, further and say, you have to do as I say, not as I do. So why are you drinking? Then the child will say, but dad, you also drink. What did I tell you? Do as I, uh, as I say, not what I, what I do, not as I do. And then we have the authoritative, collaborative. Parents sit down with children and agree on rules. If you break this rule, what happens? If you come home after your curfew uh, limit, what happens? So the children are well aware of the expectations so they can meet them. And as such, they will avoid the conflict that comes with, I told you this, again today I'm telling you this. So it's collaborative, the child can negotiate. Oh, mom, you said I should come back at six, but I asked that I come back at 6.30. So the children have a voice. The children are hard and the children participate. 
And that is the parenting style that is recommended. Often lately we hear phrases like, you parent the way you are. But I'm parenting the way I was parenting. My parents used to beat me and see how I turned out to be. I wouldn't be who I am today or what I am today. Yes, you wouldn't be what you are today, but are you okay is the question. Is your behavior rubbing your children the right way? If it wasn't, why is your child here? Or if it was, whatever. But what is your child? What, what is your child doing here? If all was well, thank you, Helen. Very much, um, very very much. I think it's very important one to find out what parenting sessions are. And in view of that, I'll just like to say that uh, when you contact us, one of the greatest needs in today's era is um, uh, probably I could call it training about parenting. And I think you hinted on it yesterday or a number of speakers hinted on it. Um, many parents are unlearned about parenting. Some are very young, like you said, some went through a very difficult time that they also don't know how to do it better. But what we have created as well is um, an opportunity for people to learn about parenting as well. In this era and age, um, we are happy that we have some people like you, we have counselors, we have tutors, we have teachers, we have educationists who have come together to provide these sessions. And so if there's any parent out there who feels like, you know what, I don't know how to do it any better. I myself were, were not well brought up in the first place. So there is no way I can have this all together. Yet I have children already growing. So we also have this available, contact us at Copat Minute. Uh, we have a solution for this because parenting is the most needed thing in this era and age. No one can help you with your own child. Teachers are trying, but they can only do so much. A parent is the first God of a child. You are all they know. You are the first authority. You understand them in and out, bearing in mind that they bear your DNA. You're most likely to understand them better and bring them out of any difficult circumstance. So we believe that all we need is to equip parents. It's a solution we have. We are able to equip you to be able to parent children of this generation. And that brings me to another question. Our team here raised a number of questions. How do we look at Gen Z problems as millennial parents? Thank you, Helen. I, I like where the discussion is going. I think first is for, for for parents to, to acknowledge that there's, there's a difference. There's so many years in between. So what could have worked then may not work now. I have a three-year-old and she will tell you, mommy, um, I'll call her and then she'll tell you, mommy, I'm busy. I don't remember saying that to my mother, even as a teenager. Even now, I, I wouldn't, um, I would say, oh, mom, what are you saying? But for her, very openly, mom, I'm still busy and that's because she's arranging her toys or something. So for us to acknowledge that just like cities are growing, humanity is also evolving. So things are changing. What could have worked then may not work now. And the key word there is may not. It doesn't mean that whatever worked in the past will not work now. There are things that still work. The dining table, yesterday Reverend was talking about the dining table where people had families had the opportunity to check in with each other and say, um, how was your day? Uh, mine was good, how can I be of help? So there are things that can, um, that can still change. So one is for us to, to acknowledge the shift but number two is for us to also check in with ourselves. What kind of parent do you desire to be? Are you the parent that desires to be looked at this way? That the moment you arrive at the gate, whether you're walking, whether you're in a border or a car, children scatter and they have to organize themselves within two minutes, like nothing happened and everyone is in their bedroom, everyone is there. So you, you command the home, are you that type? 
So for me, before I look at you as a parent, I wish to look at you as an individual. How, how well are you? Where is that anger coming from? Where is that authority of you must, you must remind your children that you're the father or you're the mother? Where is that coming from? Because before you being a parent, you're a human being. So we need to also start to have conversations around there. In addition, you talked about um, parenting. In, in psychology, we call it positive parenting. So there are actually strategies and there's research to show um, parenting styles and strategies that are positive and they will also show you the outcome. Very quickly, I will share with you um, uh, punishment and um, discipline. So for most parents, or for, I will not say most, for some parents, punishment is the thing where the child has to suffer for the mistake that they made. Whereas in positive parenting, we recommend disciplining your child. And here many parents will say, Vivian, they will put for you, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. And we say, oh, we hear that very well. But what if instead of spanking the child seriously, I look at what does this child want? This child um, enjoys SpongeBob. Mm -hmm. So instead of beating this child, can I withdraw TV time for a day or two? Because if you love your TV series, you know how hurting it is the moment you sit down and hold the remote and there is no meme, you actually feel punished. Now imagine that child, you've withdrawn something that they, they like, but also in the event that they do something good, how about you reward them? And we are saying, use rewards that are sustainable. Not that for every time you do something good, I'm going to buy you a toy. That may not be sustainable. But how about I announce, wow, guys, come and see what John has done. John has put away his toys. Can we clap for John? I mean, how do you feel when your supervisor says, can we clap for Vivian? I feel good. So I imagine what your child would feel. So using those sustainable approaches, but largely looking at positive parenting strategies, acknowledging the shift, acknowledging the changes that have come along the way. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much once again. Um, and thank you, we've built so much with the parents. There are kids who are asking questions here. And she says, I'm a child and I would like to ask a question. So if I want to ask my mother for something, for example, going out or something new that your siblings have, and she says, no, not yet. My siblings have the exact same thing I'm requesting for. What am I supposed to think? Then another similar question to that says, what do you do when your parents annoy you and others at home are siding with the parents? Thank you, Helen. I was taking down um, notes. Perhaps I start yes. with uh, perhaps I start with the last one. What do you do when parents annoy you and others side with parents with the parent? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, when we talk about positive parenting, we also encourage parents to help themselves and their children draw boundaries. So, and oftentimes we've seen that when someone does something wrong, it's out there in the public, but when they do something good, it's done or dealt with privately. So what do you do when parents are, there's something you've done, but then other people are siding with the parent. I would encourage the parent this time that when a child does something that is not good to you, how about you manage it confidentially? Even in this family setting, how about you manage it confidentially? Look at a situation where you make a mistake at work and your boss reprimands you openly. How would you feel? 
So if we could also start asking ourselves those questions, how would my child feel or how will my child feel? How will I feel? How would I feel if I, were, if I was in the same situation? We could, we could be in the sitting room and other people are siding with you. And because many of you have ganged up against me, I'll feel powerless. So yes, you're the winner. But then what happens to me? I could go to the bedroom, cry until I get done with it. And then because I am not happy with everyone in the house, I start to isolate myself, day one. Day two, I don't want to have breakfast with people. Day three, I am actually only growing resentful because of one experience. So looking at the ripple effect that some of our actions have is also important. Put yourself in your child's shoes and see how you'd feel. And perhaps that will guide how you, you interact. But I definitely, um, if I were in that position, I would feel horrible. I would feel uh, angry, frustrated if I had to be embarrassed like that. Thank you. And then, um, Helen, you may have to remind me the first question, please. The first question is that I am a child. I ask my mother for something and she says not yet, yet my other siblings have got the similar thing. What am I supposed to think? Okay, I'm how I wish, how I wish I knew the thing she was talking about, but most, um, uh, many times we hear that when it comes to phones. So it's either a phone or a PS, but usually, usually a phone or a specific type of sneakers. Um, there are parents who will tell you that as long as you're 12, I will not buy you a phone or whatever thing. So whatever that child is talking about, child, whatever your name is, it's important for you and your parent or for your parent to discuss with you why they think you cannot have that thing at that particular time or that particular age. When we send not to children, when, when parents send not to, to children without telling them the why, then that's where the problem arises. It's important for the child to know why not or why yes, not yes mm -hmm. and no. Even when you want to discipline a child, um, taking away this PS because you've refused to do your homework. I'm disconnecting the internet because you have increasingly woken up past 9 a.m. Uh, so we need to deal with that. When you show me that you can now wake up at 8 a.m., I will connect, I'll reconnect the internet. So the children should be given reasons as to why. Mm. Plus or minus. Mm. 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 I, I love that plus or minus. Uh, uh, the young, the young lady or young gentleman who has uh, your name is anonymous. Um, as I ask Catherine Nakaiza, you're going to open the microphone and ask that question. I'm going to allow you, but I just want also wanted to add on the um, on you to say that there are times when as parents, we really can't tell you why. For example, if I don't have money to buy something and I've bought it for somebody, sometimes I'm looking at the characters and I'm realizing that you're very patient and another one is not patient. I don't want to make you start becoming impatient, but because I don't have the money and I understand you, I may not be able to tell you. So also give room to parents not to explain everything because in their maturity, there are things that they don't tell you because they are saving you in some way, either protect your mind or protect you from thinking that I do this for somebody because they have this problem. There are some things that can go unnoticed. And I know in this generation, people want explanations, but sometimes as children, we need to allow it and, and, uh, and, and just know that they are doing everything in the best interest of us, believe in them, trust them uh, for something once in a while, unless the frequency is so high that every time you ask for something, they refuse. But we should, we need to give them that allowance once in a while as students. So I'm gonna ask Catherine. Catherine, you have a wonderful question, but I want you to open your microphone. Catherine Nakaiza, please ask that question if you are online. Um, 
Hello, it's me, Catherine. Uh, actually, I have a, a, a number of children with me here. So I was typing their questions. So the first question I think was answered. Uh, the second one that uh, a little one here asked is what, uh, what she would do if something bad happens to her at home and the parents are not there and she has no phone to call. And then the other one was that uh, she, they find themselves forgetting most of the things they read. Is that because of stress? They are wondering, does that cause memory loss? Thank you. I actually have Thank a number you so of much, students. Teacher Catherine. Thank you. Teacher Catherine. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Olga to respond. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Catherine, for going over and beyond and even uh, gathering the many children around you. I will start with the last one. When we talk about mental health difficulties, we also take into account the frequency and how disabling they are for, for someone. The things I talked about, um, sleep changes, uh, appetite changes, lack of motivation, for that to be deemed a mental health concern, first, it should be a mental health specialist that should confirm those, confirm with, with you those um, symptoms. But again, they should have been persistent for at least a fortnight. And we are talking about two weeks or 14 days. They should have been consistent. That behavior should have been consistent for at least 14 and, and more, more days. So forgetting, is the forgetting persistent? Is it um, to the point that it is a concern, concern to the individual or the child and those around them? Those are questions to ask. Mm -hmm. But again, more importantly is for you to note that severe stress, severe stress will compromise your memory. And that's why when you're stressed, um, you will hold your phone, but while you're holding your phone, you'll be busy looking for your phone of where is my phone, where is my phone? So stress affects our memory, severe stress to that. So it's, it's important to, to take those uh, little details into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the first question was, what do you do if something bad happens happens at home it would have also been helpful to know what exactly um what kind of situation the, the the child was was talking about but bad could mean anything um it's important that children are under the care of an adult a trusted adult at least not to leave children alone anything can happen so the adult that you're leaving your children with, is that the adult that is responsible enough to keep them safe? I would, I, if, if I had more details, then it would be helpful. So regardless of what is happening, talk to the first adult around you. If it means that you have to flee, if you have to run out, run out of the house, then you have to run out of the house. If it means you have to scream, whatever it is, your safety is paramount. Your safety is very important at that point. So whatever it is to keep you safe is what we focus on at that point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. These children really appreciate. Yeah. That was very handy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mommy Catherine for that, for bringing the children into this room. Um, one of the things we're also providing for uh, teacher or mother Catherine out there for the children is that we have an application for counselors which we can easily download on a mobile phone. That if this mobile is available, it's just for a counselor, not for really anything. It's not police. I know that these things are about to come here, but at least for a counselor, 
um, and it's an application that parents could probably keep at home in the event that children feel like these emotional turmoils around them. They are able to speak somebody in confidentiality who is, is like, like our counselor said, trusted, a trusted person. Because behind this application is a range of counselors who the child can actually contact to talk to them about something they feel that they can't tell any other person. Sometimes they even fear to tell mommy because it might involve somebody in the caliber of who mommy respects, or it might even involve mommy herself doing something that the child feels that it's disturbing them. So we have like one of the innovations we have, have this minute uh, AFIA application. You can download it on the phone and have the children access it. The good thing is that it's behind it are counselors the moment they call, they are able to talk about what is disturbing them. And the counselor is able to manage the children in this particular context and tell them how to run on with, with the issue. And should they realize that I need now to involve mommy, they can still prepare the child to now engage mommy or people at home and know how to deal with it on a large scale. So again, as Minette, uh, this is just one of the things we're just looking out of. How can we help in the world where Kids are left at home on their own. Parents have gone to work and then they continue to go through um, mental issues that are really very disturbing over a long period of time. A lot of people have grown up today, but they have gone through challenges over years in their childhood because they had nobody to call to. They had no relative who could understand. They had no neighbor who could understand. And so we are providing some of this in terms of technology to be able to help out at least such that before you grow up, this is resolved at a very tender age to avoid it feeding into the future generation that we are looking out for. Um, that is Afia Pub that is being shown there. It's an application that you can connect onto a mobile phone at home um, and you can connect and call a doctor or call a counselor for help at any one time. So this can really be very, very, very helpful to a mother who does not know what to do who does not know how to even help the children open up to any conversations. So we are readily available for you on this particular front. Thank you so very much. And hopefully that this suffices. Our contact is hope at minute. If you can be able to small letters, hope at minute.co.ugu. Um, I believe our technology person, I realize that I'm chatting, but I'm chatting in the panelist forum, but hopefully people can see that hope at minute.co.ug. Please call us. We have a solution for you in that, in that context. We can allow you access, actually, Dr. Vivian on the same platform, because behind the platform are our counselors like uh, Dr. Vivian Olga uh, to talk to the children as and when. We are also, if we are teachers on this forum again, we also have these uh, teachers can apply for it as part of their tools to help out the growing number of uh, stress among children in schools to seek for help online. And we can also make uh, arrangements to have counselors like on a monthly basis for kids to have access. Um, needless to mention at this point that we don't have as many counselors in the country with a growing population. Yesterday, uh, Dr. Kalani gave us very useful information. 26% uh, uh, of our school going students going through mental illness on average, 16% uh, uh, of girls um, going through turmoil and emotional disorders at a very, very tender age. Um, and recently he was sharing with us that the, the latest admission, the youngest admission in Butabika was, is eight years. Admission on, on drug abuse is eight years old. That is how sad the situation is. As the kids get helpless, like, like, like our counselor told us this morning, they start drinking to be able to uh, get help with the thoughts that are overwhelming them, that they don't know what to do. They're exposed to alcohol, to drugs at a very tender age. And now the absorption is not as complex. It's as, it's as small as eating a cookie. There are drugs in there. So it's not complicated. You don't have to look for a drink in a bar. So they have simplified, the people who are supplying these things have simplified this. It's in a donut, it's in a cookie, it's in a mineral water bottle. Things have been simplified. It's an oil bottle. It looks like an oil bottle, but in there are drugs. So the exposure to our children is so, so fast. And as they get frustrated, they contact people who are introducing them to some of these things. So that's why we are here to help. We're here to support 
because the statistics are so appalling. If we don't come down on the statistics, the situation for our generation tomorrow is going to be bad. And also needless to mention that if a child is, um, goes to a level, I think doctor will talk about this as well. If a child is exposed to um, clinical medicine to do with mental health, their chances of normalizing even at an adult age are so, so scarce. What does that mean? If we don't manage the mental illness at this level or the mental symptoms that we see at this level and the child reaches a level where they have to go on medication or prescriptions, chances of them normalizing given as adults are really become very, very slim. What does that mean to a population? So if you talk about 26 and we're not help them, 26% not helped, and tomorrow they're the population and they become a doctor or a lawyer or somebody, or they become married to somebody. They become a danger because they become more, most vulnerable. They are susceptible to all these things because they have already gone on medication. And I would like doctor to mention this. That's what brings us to this forum, to talk about these things, to find help before it's too late for our population tomorrow, before the numbers grow beyond what we can manage. And uh, we confirm the fact that 14 million Ugandans are all mentally sick. That is disaster in a country, I should say. So that's why we are here. Dr. Se, we have just a few minutes and I believe we are concluding. I would like to once again, thank you so much for joining this forum. Once again, tomorrow we are going to be here and tomorrow on purpose with our children. We want to talk about purpose and identity. Uh, one of the reasons why kids end up the way they do is they have not in themselves found up a reason to live. They don't have an identity on their own. They carry no purpose. They carry no nothing. And as such, anything that comes in their place can easily um, uh, disorient them. So we want to have our teacher, our educationist come here to talk about purpose and identity in children, just to equip them to make them understand that you are something very, very, very important to us today. And that if you understand it now, it's gonna help us bring you up with a vision, with a clear identity, with a clear purpose such that nothing can distract you. So that is for tomorrow. Um, Dr. Olga, please. Helen, to be sure, you want me to talk about uh, the drug beat, right? Yes, yes. Mm. How I wish we had um, Dr. Kalani back here today, but it is well. Dr. Kalani is a psychiatrist, so it would be best place to talk about um, medication when it comes to, to mental health. But mm. to share what, what I know so far is it's important for us to consider prevention rather than response. So what are some of the things we can do to improve our own mental health as children, I mean, as parents, because in one way or the other, it rubs on the mental health of, of our children or the children around us. What are some of the things that we can do? I hope that can be food for thought. Even then, usually when we talk about mental health, people picture um, a very dirty man or woman, uh, walking on the streets of, of, of Kampala, eating from, from the garbage cans and, and the like. But I hope that today you appreciate that even uh, people who are dressed like you and I have mental health challenges. They are up and about, but behind the scenes, they have mental health challenges. That said, depending on how severe and how disabling the mental health condition one has at that point, depending on how uh, it's affecting their life and how severe it is, then the need for, for medication may have to be um, discussed. The psychiatrists do that. The clinical psychologists in this country do not prescribe or rather give medication. When you're given that medication, usually people say, oh, this is the end of me. I am done, I am finished but mental health affects your brain chemistry. Mental health affects the way your brain should, should help you. Some, we've seen children who start to see things that other people are not seeing, and then people start saying those are ghosts, but we call them hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Children will start, some children start to hear things, some sometimes even telling them, um, 
go go at this place and kill yourself so those voices those visions they can only be treated using medication but even when medication has been given therapy the counseling that we talk about will still have to be um, provided as well so getting the medication is not the end of the world but it is important that when given the medication take it as prescribed even when you feel better for most people as soon as they start to feel better because i mean you're not eating cashew nuts or whatever nuts you're not eating cake it's medication so for most people once they start to feel okay they abandon the medication talk to your psychiatrist before you make any changes if you have significant side effects also talk to your psychiatrist about it but the goal is for no one to take the medication but that whatever we have is managed using uh, talk therapy or other counseling mm -hmm. so for you to avoid the medication please take care of your yourself take care of your children take care of those around you yeah. i hope that will suffice Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, raised this question, says, I have a problem. Uh, thanks for the presentation about the connection with our teenagers. However, I would like to know how best I can tell my children that despite the separation with their dad three years ago, I still love them so much without affecting their ego and esteem in their development. And uh, our, one of our great, great counselors, uh, Ivas Kansime Atwine has responded and said, in addition to what we have mentioned here about family conflict, parents and separation, uh, parents need to be intentional about healthy cooperating, co-parenting. The word is co-parenting. That means even when you are separated, you need to find a way of en enabling the children meet either parents on agreed uh, platforms. One of the things you do as you separate, agree on how children will be able to relate with both of them instead of cutting them off from one side. And I know that sometimes one side can be so mean, we don't want anything about it, but because it affects the children, it is something that we probably need to be intentional about, negotiate for it if it's the last negotiation you need to do for this relationship. And it says that she says that children need to be able to access both parents in their lives, even when they are separated. This is very, very important. Your differences, the, the human body in a child does not understand it, does not rhyme with it. Sometimes even when they see you fighting over and over again, it does not occur to them that I can ever stay with my parents, you know, without one or the other. And so I think this is very important. Now, Miss Evers is one of our counselors again on board. She's um, a good parenting counselor, a good counselor for children, a good counselor for adults. Again, she's one of those counselors that we rely on for parenting lessons for many of our clients. So feel free to contact us in case you want to access her. And then there's another question. I realize we still have a couple of minutes left before we, we see off. It's a question that was asked, can depression in a teenager present itself as a selfish need for special attention from parents. And then the other question, this goes to you, Dr. Olga. How can you guide uh, on parenting a teenager who is going through loss of a parent coupled with adolescence symptoms? Over to you. And uh, after those questions, we will, we will close our session at exactly 12.30. Okay, thank you, Helen. How can uh, can depression in teenagers present itself as a selfish need for special attention from the parents? Whatever behavior children present with, we say every behavior is meaningful. Whether the child is seeking for attention, whether the child is seeking for whatever you can name, we shall now in, in, when the children come to us or when we are discussing with parents, what is important is if it's attention, why the attention? If it's violence, why the violence? So we say every behavior is meaningful. And again, sadness presents with the follow, I mean, depression presents with the following symptoms. 
sadness, social withdrawal, changes in sleep uh, and, um, and appetite, lack of motivation, sometimes even having feelings of um, I, I am better off dead. So if to a parent that is seeking attention, then we really have to talk about certain details. But in short, I'm saying every behavior is meaningful. Every behavior is telling us something. So we have to go back to the drawing board and see what is this child telling us by oversleeping? What is this child telling us by, by not wanting to go to school? But also for you to consider that we don't only um, look at one symptom. It should be at least six symptoms that have been persistent by fortnight. So I hope um, with that, I answer that parent. Then the next one is um, about um, how can you guide um, a parent? How can you guide on parenting a teenager who is going through loss of a parent coupled with adolescent, uh, adolescent symptoms? So there's two things here that I see. One is grief and the other is adolescent, adolescence. Whatever it is, as long as you're a human being, grief will affect you. The loss of a loved one will affect you. And grief, there is no one fit uh, size for everyone that is grieving to say, oh, we, we have to all grieve for two weeks. Oh, you're grieving for too long. No. Why? Because grief is a process. There is a process, and the process is not linear. So it's not that after the shock, I'll feel angry, I'll feel depressed, and then I'll accept the, the loss. No, I could reach a certain stage and then bounce back to the, to the first stage, which, which is shock. So that said, it's, it's important to remember that this human, this adolescent, this adolescent in front of me is a human being who is grieving the loss of a, of a loved one. Even if it was a child, even if it was an adult, we have to look at the first principle. First, a human being, and then see ways of supporting you to work through that grief. That's how um, I would look at that, that matter. Thank you, Helen. Helen, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Olga. I hardly have time left for this session, but I would like to once again welcome all those who joined in. I have a couple of questions that I feel like need to be answered. One is that I've shared, uh, Catherine, I've shared uh, my contact with you to try and help that young child who seems to have a challenge at home. That, that they don't have a phone as expressed and they really need help. We'll see what we can do. And then there's one uh, parent supposed to discuss all marital problems with children, especially if dad is cheating and my mom always runs to us to discuss these details with us. I feel that is wrong because it makes us side with mommy more. Again, in our parenting lessons, these are some of the things we talk to, depending on the age, there are details about us parents that we don't have to share in order to protect children, but we need to understand the age of the child, but also we also know that you can't tell a child every detail. It's a lot of pain for them to go through because it's adult things that you're putting in a child's brain to try and harmonize, take sides, um, a child is not supposed to have anybody they don't like. A child loves everybody as they come in. For them to start putting their dad on a certain side because of what you're presenting is really too much for them. Again, please, um, our, our, our contact is hope at minute. Let's see the solutions we can have with the available means such that we can discuss some of these things. Parenting les lessons are very key in this matter for us to understand and uh, some of us happen to be mothers when we are so young. Some of us happen to be mothers after a lot of trouble. So these are challenges again. The last question I want, I would like to just address is I'm a child. What do I do when I have done something like breaking something in the house, but it is difficult for me to tell my parents the truth. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, young child. Um, again, depending on how parents, we've been talking to parents not to be so hard on us, but ideally saying the truth would be very, very, very important. It really doesn't harm. But also, I think we need also to learn as children that rebuke is very important. If I've done something wrong and my parents want to rebuke me, except if it's go to the extreme, that's okay. Because when I do something wrong, it's not something they're supposed to praise me for but otherwise they're supposed to put me in the right place. But please continue, don't hide it from parents. Tell them the truth. It might be bitter, but in future we realize that it helps you to always say the truth, to fix things and, and take responsibility for what you've done wrong. How possible is it for us to get this application? Uh, please contact hope at minet.co.ug and we guide you on how to take this on or call 0703 seven five zero five one nine to see what we can do about this application once again contact hope at minute.co.ug all zero seven zero three seven five zero five one nine thank you so much our participants for today thank you so much dr olga our tech team at timothy and henry I want to thank you so much for today, my co-presenter and moderator, Doreen Moulia, thank you so much for being in today. Tomorrow, once again, tune in same time, 11 to 12, 30 for yet another session with the teenagers. We would like to speak to the minds of our teenagers. We want to talk about identity and purpose tomorrow with Pastor Sam Barnabas Aliko. Thank you so much. I want to say bye for now. Thank you. Have a great day.